How are you? I'm good. Lovely to be here. I was sad because you were on the show, I think, for I Shot Andy Warhol, but I missed you. I wasn't there that day, so yeah. I was lucky to get the chance to to get the chance to talk to you. And you're back in Canada. I know you're, we were just saying you're living in New York now, but it's it's nice to be back to Canada. Oh, well. always nice to be back in Toronto. Is it is it in any way extra meaningful for you to be for this film to be coming out of TIFF? Oh, very much so. You know, I wish my dad was alive. You know, he would have loved to see, be here and see it. But I have a lot of family here who are going to come, and that's that's great for me. I'm I'm glad. So, what is it about Dolly that interested you? Well, it was really my husband wrote the screenplay, and it, he persuaded me because at first. I thought, well, I've, I did a film by Andy Warhol. I don't want to do another film about an artist. But then he pointed out that two things. One is it's it's really a, could be a film about a marriage. Yeah. You know, and it was fun for us as a husband and wife, you know, to collaborate on a film about a marriage. A very different marriage to ours, very stormy and, and crazy marriage. But also that Dolly is such a strange kind of extraterrestrial person. Yeah. You know, he's very hard to get a handle on. Yeah. As, you know, to get inside him. But as John pointed out, you know, one of the motivating things is it's an artist in the last years of his life, terrified of death and aging. And that's on the, you know, that's human. Anybody can relate to that. And and the same with Gala, the two people who started out so close, in a way, their fear of death, they almost can't be around each other because they remind each other that they're old. Yeah. That's such a lovely point. I mean, at the very beginning of the, at the very beginning of the film, but I think maybe 10, 15 minutes in, someone, Dolly says something along the lines of like, uh, uh, well, I, I I am sort of God. I don't think I mean, it's not that God and I are compare, comparable. I am very very close to God. And then like ten minutes later, he has to take his medication. You yeah. know, there is you you can watch this man really uh, deal with his humanity in those moments. And also, he had a kind of Parkinson, so his hand is sh- for a painter. I mean, he he did manage to kind of still his hand while he was painting, but you can see his hand shaking, and he drops a glass. You know, and and his own physical sort of vulnerability. Is is getting to him? There was a speaking of Andy Warhol. There's a there's a, a quote that Andy Warhol used to describe Salvador Dali that I've heard you were you were fond of. He said, "quote He was both more old fashioned than any of us, and more advanced than any of us." Yes. Why or the future, more of the past? Why did that resonate with you so much? Well, because it, it was true. Because I think a lot of the times we think of him as the 1930s, you know, the great period of surrealism, but he kept working right, you know, up until about four or five years before he died. Actually, when his wife died. He basically died, even though he lived for five or six years after that. He stopped working. But he he was doing holograms. He was fascinated with physics. He had all kinds of ideas about being an, you know, an idea of being an artist, which people were very uh, contemptuous of at the time, which was that I'm going to design furniture and I'll do commercials and I'll make jewelry and I'll I'll have a sort of factory of art. And, you know, that's what Jeff Koons does or Damien Hirst. You know, it's a very modern idea of being an artist. And people now have rediscovered and said, actually, no, he kept thinking the idea of what an artist is for the modern world. And, you know, you can, there are certainly things you can criticize in him. Yeah. There was, um, it's a sort of part of the film that Gala got him to sign endless sheets of blank paper that were then used to print lithographs that often were just Xeroxes. And that was originally going to be most of the conceit of the film, or that was supposed to be a big part of the film at first, right? That's the, as the project was brought to us, it was more about art fraud. But in a way, there's not that much emotional, personal story that you can say about art fraud. Yes, it happened, and yeah. and, and it's part of, you know, and, you know, this happened also, there's a lot of fake Picasso lithographs and all, you know, it was, it's part we're, of We're dealing the, with that here in Canada right now. I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a lot of that, you know, with well, the Elmore, so, yeah. It's a moment when the art world, there's a, a line where um, Rupert Graves' ca- character says, a painting's never just a painting, not anymore. You know, and it's really about art as a commodity. You know, that's definitely part of, of the, the story of Dali in the 70s. It's the beginning, beginning when the art market went wild. So it's part of the story, but it's emotionally or dramatically, I didn't want to make it the main story. But I was more fascinated with... Um, you know, and Dali's a great artist. Yes, this happened, but I, do, I don't think that it it takes away from his essential achievement as an artist. It's an unfortunate part of it. But, you know, what happens to a kind of great artist and a, and a legendary marriage in its last years when all's falling apart? <laughs> yeah. 
Can can you talk talk more about the marriage? Because I think even for me going into this, I was expecting a film about Salvador Dali, mm. and I ended up watching a, a really beautiful film about two people, about Salvador Dali and, and Gala. Mm. For, just can you give people who are listening to this who maybe aren't as familiar with her talk to me a little bit about her and them? Yes. Well. Gala is in many ways presented as a great villain in art history, but she was Dali's muse. You know, he dedicated everything to her. He used to say, my paintings are done with her blood, you know, and she devoted her life to him. Um, she was a, a few years, like 12 years older. They met when he was in his early 20s. Um, and, and so they were like art warriors. You know, she saw in him... She'd been the lover of everybody, by the way, all the famous, you know, she was married to someone else and she'd lived with Max, had a sort of menage a trois with Max Ernst. I mean, she she had sort of slept with everybody and she was a great femme fatale. Anyway, she took up with Dali. They maybe, who knows, they had maybe sex a few times, but it was basically a sexless marriage. He was a voyeur and she had like innumerable young lovers right up into her, you know, 70s and beyond. Um, and so, but what, what bound them together was not sex. It was her their shared belief in his art. But, you know, and it was incredibly close. They were like one person for many years. And then when they came to America and he became a celebrity, people like ignored Gala. People didn't want to know. It wasn't Dali and Gala anymore. It was yeah. just Salvador Dali, the star. And I think she felt kind of bitter about that. And then he stopped painting so much and was doing things like holograms, which she didn't like. And she just like be a great painter in this in the tradition of Velasquez, and so they they just started to grow apart. But they were still so. I think what the film shows is they're still so bound up together. Yeah. Like like I say, when when she died, he was basically that was the end of him. It's funny you mentioned that when he comes to America, he becomes this celebrity because in the, in the era in which the majority of this film takes place, which is in mm. the nineteen seventies. I, I was I was trying to figure out what exactly America thought about Dali at the time because in some ways he mm. was this he was being respected as this great painter from the surrealist era as you mentioned. Mm. He had also become a bit of a caricature of himself, a bit of a cartoon. Yes. So for for people who don't know, talk to me a little bit about this era of Dali's life and how he was perceived in the in the New York art scene at the time. Which yes. Was changing, right? Yes. I mean, because you know he was the first artist to be on the cover of Time magazine. That was in like the, the early thirties, and then. You know, when in our period in the 70s, which is the bulk of the film, you know, he wasn't cool because it was the time of minimalism and conceptual art. And it was, he was considered old fashioned and also kind of a joke because he did these commercial things like he'd do a, an ad for chocolate, a chocolate bar or something. And, and he also had created this very strong persona which is a bit of a caricature of himself, but, you know, with the mustache, yeah. he, created, he created an image that was very, very marketable. And I think Andy Warhol learned everything from him. Really? Yes. He learned how to create a persona, how to have a defining, uh, you know, with Warhol it was the wig and with Dali it's the mustache. And, and then he learned how to, you know, don't be afraid of commercialization, you know, design furniture, you know, trademark things, you know, do a certain mass production. Uh, but at the same time, they're both great artists. You know, th there's a – it's complicated with this late stage of modern art because I think what they both said is they weren't pretending like people felt much more revered reverence for Picasso, although Picasso did a lot of mass production too. Yeah. And Warhol and Dali were much more unclassifiable and they were more – we accept the modern world. We accept, you know, mechanization. We accept commercials, you know. I don't know. They embraced it in a way that, that the fine art world disapproved of. They weren't going to let anybody else define who they were as artists, whether they be art purists or commercialization. I, yeah. I and I think that. one thing about Dali was he was a populist. Yeah. Yeah. He loved – I mean, he loved the great tradition of art, particularly of Spanish art, of Velasquez and, and, um, and El Greco and all that. But he also loved – like he'd go into a Times Square gift store and buy some knickknack and say, I see beauty here. Right. So he saw beauty in things that other people might not see beauty in, in ordinary commercial things or mass-produced things. He could see beauty everywhere. And that, I think, is the thing that I most admire about him. He had no defining – categories. Mm. He didn't think in terms of high and low. Mm. He just saw, what is this? Do I like it? Do I see beauty? 
weren't you in New York in the 70s, in the art scene around then? And in, in, in sort of 75, you know, to say like 79, 78. Um, and it was a, a fantastic time, maybe one of the greatest times of my life. What were you doing there? I was had just left college and I was like, I don't know, working as a waitress and discovered the, you know, uh, punk scene and CBGBs that was very early on. And but then I also had some uptown friends and I really remember going kind of being living, you know, in the East Village, and then occasionally I'd go uptown, and uh, and then being invited to crazy parties. It was just an amazing time where doors opened for you because it was you're young and it's an open time when people just invite invite yeah. you along for the ride. And was he was he mentioned? I mean, I, you know, I was certainly aware of him. Um, he was around. He was around. I was more aware of Warhol. Yeah. You know, um, but that was at that point Warhol was more like of an, a bit of an. But Warhol would come to CBGBs and stuff. Um, I, I think I was aware of him, but not, you know, I think he was more like definitely an uptown world. He wasn't, he never came across him back in those days or anything like that. You no, know, never no, the people I know, him. people I know from the time did, did meet him at, you know, a Warhol event or at Studio 54. And where did you call these people when you were talking to them? You know, I talk, I ta you know, we, we talked to a ton of people. We talked, everybody from, you know. Gala's gynecologist to, you know, <laughs> people who've been really? there. Really? Well, his, the wife yeah, of the gynecologist. Yeah, yeah. Um, we talked to Dolly's, you know, somebody done his hairdresser, you know, just people who'd been in and visited the hotel. Give and, me something surprising about him. We, we talked to a, uh, someone who'd been a child, the son of one of Dolly's servants in Spain, in Catechez, in, in Port Legat. And just something that I wanted to put in the film of Dali kind of imitating Charlie Chaplin, like doing some sort of sliding dance on a, on a, on a polished floor. And I just thought, oh. I wish, I wish we could have got that in. Yeah, he was a, he was a bit of a showman. He was showman. A of... He just loved, you know. They all loved silent film. The surrealists. It's it's a, an interesting time to be talking to you here in in Canada because I know you, you grew up in Canada. You grew up in the UK, and I wanted to spend some time just in the time we have left talking a little bit about your career in film mm -hmm. because I'm I'm talking to a lot of first time filmmakers yeah. this time around. People coming in mm -hmm. with their first ever feature film. How did the idea of making a film at all first come to you? Well, you know, when I was growing up, there were no female film directors that I knew of, apart from Lenny Riefenstahl. You yeah. know, I really had never heard of one until Lena Wertmuller, I think, was the first. And that was I was in my 20s when I saw Swept Away. Um, and and so it just never occurred to me that I could be a director. And But then I was a journalist. But then I had all these friends in working at the BBC and in British television doing documentaries. So the step from journalism to documentary is not so so big. And I, I really want to do documentary. And I really want to do film. But the idea that I could make a film, I remember the first time somebody said to me, oh, well, if you're going to, to, to go into television, you, you, you should make films. And the, I, I, thought, I was so embarrassed that anybody thought that I could make a film one day. It's like, no, of course I couldn't make films. Why not? I think because I thought of it as a very technical endeavor and I'm not a very technical person. Yeah. But then, you know, as I, you know, as I was on a lot of shoots and it took me ages to get the chance, five years to get the chance to direct. And then I realized, actually, you just have to know what you want. The director is the conductor of the orchestra, and everyone else has the expertise. And you have to ha you have to control the tone and the picture and the overall sort of uh, you know vision of it. And so then it was not as you know that I thought, oh yeah, there's I can do this. Did did, did the journalism part help you? Because I know um, I would know your work. Well, I know you did one of the early Sex Pistols interviews. Yes, yes. right. What, what year was that? That was seventy six. And they were they were still pretty. Oh yeah, no, that was the height, and and it, there was like a half empty concert in Liverpool, and when I got backstage, uh, Johnny Rotten said, "Oh, we haven't been inf interviewed by anybody from America before," and they were nice to me because I was I was for Punk Magazine, so I had my Punk Magazine T-shirt, and so I was not like from a big big paper. They were nice to you. Yeah, they were because you know I I think because I seemed I was from a fanzine. But my point being is is um, though I am I am I am personally still kind of terrified of interviewing Johnny Rotten a little bit. <laughs> I would be too. Yeah, yeah, yeah to, to this day. Through talking to, up to that point, talking to artists about their work, did it help you guide you when you found your way to your own work, creative work? I mean, it might have. I mean, I'm, I'm, sure, it, I'm sure it did. Um, but it also gave me a lot of material because, for instance, I got the idea for our show, Andy Warhol. I had also written a lot about Warhol when I was a journalist and yeah. that I'd done the history of the Velvet Underground. Yeah. And done a lot of work on that world and interviewed everybody I could. But then I, I worked on a documentary about Warhol um, for the South Bank. So that's when I, the idea occurred to me about Valerie Solanas. Yeah. And then being a researcher and looking at a lot of different footage, a lot of things that I did in my films, early films, like mixing black and white and color, mixing different kinds of film stock, that's something that you do in documentary. 
and so it just seemed natural to me. There are certain stylistic things. I learned a bit like, oh, I like wide lenses. You know, there's things you just pick up. And then I think you pick up, uh, you know, about being in a, in a crew and part of a team because it's, you know, film is collaborative. But the first time I was on a film set for my first day on I Shot Andy Warhol, I was looking around the room like terrified, like there are 30 people in this crew. And I, I've, I've just never been in a crew of more than just like four people. What do they all do? Mm -hmm. How will I remember everyone's name? You know, and I just thought, okay, I just rely on, on the, on the, my DP, DP, great female DP, Ellen Kors, and my, and my first AD. And they'll just have to carry me through. And as you mentioned, you're just the captain of the ship. You just have to make sure it's going where it's supposed to be going. Yeah. You don't have to shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's interesting because you did develop such a style. I mean, you made films about Charles Manson, mm -hmm. Valerie Solanas, as you mentioned, uh, the woman who shot Andy Warhol. Uh, of course, famously, you did American Psycho. That reminds me, have you seen that? Like, you notice American Psycho has become like a meme on... Oh, I noticed, started noticing this, this a few years ago. People started sending me um, links. And I have to say, I'm very grateful to it because it, it really kept the film alive and got it a whole new audience. There are some fantastic parodies. They're almost all good. There was one they did a few years ago. Some Dutch jeans company did a hipster parody of, of the business card scene where they're talking about coffee and denim. And it's hilarious. So I'm, I'm grateful for all the memes. It's all the business card scene. There's, yeah. a, there's like a big thing on TikTok <laughs> right now where people do parodies of the business. I was, I was, I I didn't know. If, I didn't. Some people are with their with their work. You know, some people can be. I'm not precious about it. I'm I'm grateful. I'm grateful if 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 it, people if it amuses people if it it sparks anything in them. Thank you. I think it's also got people to watch the film in in, in the past couple of years in a way. I was talking to someone the other day who thought that film came out like two years ago. <laughs> I mean, I'm so glad because I think if you if you make one thing that hits the zeitgeist, mm -hmm. you got to be grateful. And and probably it will only be one, you know, th that hits the zeitgeist in that way. I mean, you'll make things that are, that that people like or don't like, but hitting the zeitgeist is just like hitting winning the lottery, you know. Well, it, so I it brought to mind. So we had Cronenberg in a little while ago, oh. um, and we had a grand old time with him. We did a big long career mm. chat with him, mm. and he, he was mm. so wonderful. But we had a great time asking about the various titles that the media have given him over the years. <laughs> so we, we said to him, we said, like, how do you feel about Baron of Blood? And he, you know, and I said, how do you feel about – one of my favorites was the King of Venereal Horror, <laughs> which is not what you want to be called at any point in your life. And we ended up doing that for you a little bit here. Oh, okay. And the one you get called the most is the Psychopath Auteur. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. I mean – I've only done – well, I, I mean, I suppose you could – if you called Valerie – I was going to say, well, I've just done American Psycho and Charles Manson were my psychopaths. But I guess you, in some ways, some people would say Valerie was. I, I would sort of think it was a little bit different. Um, and then there's, you know, Alias Grace, jury's out on you know, <laughs> what Grace was exactly. But is there something about – but is there something about these characters – I mean, I know this may be a bit of a stretch, but, you know, Manson and, and Valerie Solanas and, and – um, in, in Alias Grace and all, the, all these, these various films, we were wondering whether Dolly is related to these characters at all, whether you see any kind of continuation, or is this a bit of a, a, a deviation for you? Well, you know, my husband wrote the script, and he originally did romantic comedy, so it's probably a somewhat warmer and, 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 and gentler version of film than I, I normally do, um, although we're, we're very much in, in agreement on, on, on his, that approach he took. Um, I don't, you know, people have asked me, I have no idea why I make the films I do. It, it, what you're drawn to, it's it's like you just have to follow, you just have to be true to yourself about what, if you find it interesting, other people will find it interesting. You know, you can't fake it. You can't try and be someone you're not. And I don't know, because I'm pretty, you know, sane person, I think. Yeah. I, I don't know. Don't seem like a psychopath at all. <laughs> I'm not worried for my safety. <laughs> no, I, I hope not. We, we'll just hold on there. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I don't know. I think I, think I am interested in... in psychological extremes and people in in extreme states that's all i can say does it when you look at a dolly painting mm. now after making this film mm. does it change the way you look at it knowing that you know after spending some time exploring the human behind them oh yeah completely i think also because his works are full of symbols and he reused like any kind of great artist you, the same things crop up and you think oh that's that's crutches you know i, I read his autobiography and that has from that at, Incident as child, you know, you can just kind of interpret it, and which is one of the pleasures of, of studying somebody's work. Mary, it's such a joy to talk to you. Mary Heron, the award winning director and screenwriter. Oh.